to the last uh, presentation panel of the conference before we have our round table. And this is session eight on diaspora engagement. Our first presenter is Elizabeth Mavrudi. Again, 15 minutes for each paper. I do have a timer, so I will be very ruthless about that. <clears throat> My name is um, Liz Mavuzi. I'm at the Department of Geography at Loughborough um, University. Um, this is briefly what I'm going to be talking about today. Very briefly, um, introduction, tiny bit of literature, tiny bit on context, uh, and really trying to sort of get to grips with um, diaspora mobilization and diaspora engagement, which is, of course, the, the theme of this particular um, session. Um, what I should say at the outset is that what I'm presenting um, today, um, I've written about already in a, a paper for the Journal of African Migration Studies, which was published last year, and an earlier uh, book chapter uh, in a book um, co-edited with um, Anastasia a few years ago. Um, so it's, it's stuff that's already been um, published, but I will try at the end to kind of um, talk a little bit more about the, the particular themes um, of this conference uh, and to talk more about sort of recommendations and things like that. Um, the other thing I should point out is that um, I did this research, um, uh, it was based on, a, on qualitative research um, carried out in Canberra um, and in Melbourne in Australia. It was funded by an Australian National University um, Research Fellowship. I was based at the Centre of European Studies there, so I, just, I should just flag that up um, from now. Um, I wasn't there for, for a huge amount of time, so <laughs> in terms of the research that I did, I did what I could uh, in a very limited period of time. Um, it, I did 50 um, in-depth um, interviews uh, with a wide variety um, of people. So it was elites, it was non-elites, um, it was people from you know, different occupations, um, people positioned differently, I suppose, um, within the diaspora, but including people um, you know, who were perhaps more well-known with the diaspora. But I do have to be very careful in terms of protecting uh, participants' um, anonymity, of course. Um, so what I wanted to also say is that it's very much a kind of snapshot um, of you know, what people were thinking and feeling at that particular moment in time and space. The research was conducted in early 2012, okay? So I can only comment on what people actually, you know, said to me um, at that moment in time. Uh, my own background is, you know, I've done um, different pieces of research on different diasporic groups. So, for instance, the, the GEMS paper was a comparison of diaspora mobilization amongst the Palestinian diaspora and the Greek diaspora. Um, <clears throat> so... There are plenty of people who know a great deal more about the Greek diaspora uh, in Australia um, than I do. <laughs> I, I should point that out. Um, so I don't want to say too much at this late stage of the, <laughs> of the conference when everybody's probably thinking about, you know, uh, leaving and so forth. Uh, but I did want to say a little bit about how um, I theorize um, diaspora. Um, I know that yesterday we kind of started off this kind of process of, you know, what do we mean by diaspora? Obviously, it is a very contested notion. Clearly, there's going to be differing um, opinions. Um, I just want to position my own research and my own thinking um, in that I, th I see diasporas very much as kind of fluid, dynamic, active entities that are continuously um, on the move and evolving through time and space. Um, and I think that, you know, as a geographer, you know, I am aware... Um, and I like to sort of pay particular attention, I suppose, as we all do, to the particularities of time, space and place uh, and the ways in which um, diasporic identities and lives are negotiated and articulated and performed uh, in very particular ways. OK. Um, having said that, we also need to pay attention to the ways in which power relations occur on the ground, um, how people in diaspora can create potentially more narrow, more inward-looking, perhaps more stereotypical um, understandings and versions of themselves, if you like, uh, for whatever reason. It could be strategic, um, you know, for unity purposes and so forth. Um, I think it is useful to think through this kind of um, roots and roots um, idea, which, of course, Clifford and others have, have talked about. Uh, Brubacher has talked about this idea of boundary maintenance and erosion, it's this kind of constant process of trying to define who, you know, who we are um, in relation to here and there, 
in relation to past, present, and future, okay? So I guess the version of the way that I think about diasporas is that they are messy, okay? Um, I don't think that typologies and categories and classifications, personally, I don't think they're very useful. When you do in-depth research on diasporic lives, people's emotions, what they feel able to do, and so forth, I think it's very difficult. Um, so that's <laughs> a little bit about um, where I'm coming from. I wanted to say a little bit about um, diaspora and development because I see really what we're kind of talking about here uh, as a kind of subset, if you like, of a wider, a huge literature on the relationships between not only diaspora and development, but migration and development more generally, and the role that migrants and those in diaspora can play um, in their homeland. Uh, and clearly, you know, as I said, it's a huge literature. I don't have time to, to go through it here. But the thing that I really wanted to kind of highlight and pinpoint is this idea of diaspora mobilization and what people actually feel able to do. And what I wanted to stress here is that I don't think that it's just about elites, okay? I think it's important to look at non-elites as well. And I don't really like that. It's kind of quite a dualistic um, distinction. Um, but this idea of who is included and perhaps who is excluded um, in um, diaspora strategies. So I'm thinking of the work of people like Wendy Larner and Elaine Ho, both geographers, um, who have talked about how homeland states harness the diaspora and how in this process they include and exclude people. Okay, who is deemed worthy of being included in these kind of diasporic strategies and who is worthy of being engaged with, if you like, who are states trying to attract in terms of mobilization. Um, so there are critical questions to be asked there um, in relation to that. So I think that we do need to unpack um, this idea of obligation. Okay, there is an assumption, I think, by homeland states uh, <clears throat> that there. Um, a diaspora will have some sort of loyalty, have some sort of obligation. And that's really what the whole kind of diaspora and development literature is all about. It's about, we've got this group of people, let's tap them, you know, let's, you know, let's get their money, let's get their expertise. Uh, but I think that we need to look at who these people are and what they feel, you know, about the assumptions made about them. Um, so, you know, I, I refer here to the work of uh, Paige and Tanya. Um, there's this idea that mobilization is not given, it's something that has to be learnt, okay? And I think that is a useful thing to bear in mind when we think about diaspora engagement, okay, in terms of how it might actually look um, on the ground and what people feel about it, okay? So really what I'm presenting today is about people's perceptions, okay? It's not necessarily, you know, the reality, okay, but it's about how people feel uh, whether they feel able to help at a time of crisis. Um, and as part of that, I think that we need to ask critical questions about who counts um, as a diaspora, okay? Um, I've done work with my, my colleague Heike Jerns uh, and Mike Heffernan at Nottingham um, <clears throat> about trying to think through more inclusive and flexible notions of diaspora. So in this paper, we talk about the elective diaspora, for instance. Uh, it's on German-American um, academic exchanges, and it's based on, on Heike's um, research. Uh, but in that paper, we use um, other notions, such as the affinity diaspora, to really kind of think more critically about who should or who can and who, you know, be included as part of a diaspora. And we really kind of take a very open view. So, for example, we argue that people, uh, it's not just about ethno-nationalism, it's not just about blood ties. Uh, we need to open it up to think more critically about um, other types of connections that people have to, either to their homeland, or people, let's say, I mean, there, was, there were examples in the paper, um, of people that are married to people from that homeland, you know, who don't have these kind of biographical connections, but who have emotional attachments, okay, to a particular location. And, you know, these kinds of emotional attachments, we argue, are really important, okay? Um, so finally, I suppose the, the thing that I want to stress is that, you know, we need to think about whether diasporic support um, can actually be guaranteed. Um, I don't really have time to go into the, you know, a lot of the, the research, there's a really quite large amount of research that's been conducted on you know, the Greek diaspora in Australia. 
Um, I can only reference um, work that's been done sort of before me. I think there is, you know, from what I understand, there is kind of this narrative of you know, Greek Australians being, you know, successful, you know, that they've sort of, they've made it in a way, they've overcome, you know, perhaps, you know, the racism that they encountered, some of them encountered initially. Um, you know, they've done good, it's, it's, it's that kind of idea. And when I went into this um, research project initially, you know, that's kind of, I had this kind of image, if you like, of, yes, you know, they've done well, um, and at the same time, there was, there was this other research that, of course, you know, Anastasia is, is part of that was really kind of quite critically unpacking what it means to kind of be and feel um, Greek um, in diaspora and really kind of stressing the kind of the materialities, the emotionalities of what it means to be um, Greek. And this kind of very active process of, you know, how people become, how they feel Greek in diaspora, okay? which is different, of course, to being, you know, Greek um, in Greece. Um, <coughs> this presentation is not on, you know, necessarily on identity. Um, I want to focus much more on the kind of the, the connections and diaspora engagement. But I just wanted to kind of highlight a few things that I found um, in my um, research. Um, but basically, um, there are many ways to kind of feel and be Greek. I think that, that's the bottom line. It happens in particular times, particular spaces. Uh, I'm happy to talk about um, those. The other thing I wanted to stress is that there are also tensions in diaspora, okay? I think that there are always tensions, there are always disunities, okay? People might construct unities for particular reasons to us as researchers, but I think there are always tensions. In this case, I found that there was, there was tensions in terms of language ability. So, you know, whether um, you can call yourself Greek or whether you're allowed to feel Greek if you don't speak Greek, for instance. Uh, and there were tensions there in terms of what people thought. So the background of why I did this research was that there was this kind of potential, if you like, for um, diaspora and development. Um, there was potential for the diaspora to, you know, have some sort of involvement in the homeland. But, you know, this hasn't been happening. Okay, so part and parcel of what I was trying to do was to uncover the reasons um, for this. Okay, um, very briefly, there were connections and disconnections to Greece. Okay, um, there were obviously very strong emotional atta attachments to Greece. People felt very connected emotionally. Um, they didn't necessarily visit um, that often because it's expensive um, to visit, especially if you have a family. Um, so people, you know, did feel that kind of sense of isolation a little bit. And there were these kind of insider and outsider perceptions for some, okay, not for everybody. Um, so people feeling, you know, different um, when they went there. Um, economic connections, I mean, I've just listed a few here. There's obviously more there's sort of giving to um, local charities and things like that. But you know, there, there, were, there was evidence that people were you know, helping in some way, in some small way, in terms of um, their economic connections. Um, perceptions of Greece, I don't really need to go through this. It's all, you know, it's, <laughs> a lot of it was quite negative. I have to say I was a little bit shocked <laughs> with some of the, the negativity that was, uh, you know, put forward. Um, there were some positives as well. Um, I think people, especially the, the, the second generation, I should stress that I did research with the first and the second generation, uh, particularly the second generation and those who had spent more time in Greece did have an understanding of how Greece um, has been um, changing um, and they were kind of realistic about that, if you like. Um, helping, well, I've already mentioned on a personal level, you know, people might buy things, like they might buy Greek products, they'll go to Greece, you know, to spend money there. But equally, there were people who said, you know what, if I go to Europe, I might not necessarily go to Greece. You know, I'm not necessarily that committed to going there. Um, so people did problematize that kind of the need to be connected materially, um, if you like. Um, sending money in more official ways, the sort of the, the, the government, even the sort of more recognized NGOs, um, investing. People were extremely negative about this. I think one of the reasons um, for this is that there People had tried, or they knew people who had tried, for instance, people had sent money, um, people had tried to invest, and there were a lot of hurdles, okay? And I've, I've listed a huge uh, list of things there, which um, I go into in more detail um, in the paper, which I'm happy to talk uh, more about. 
Um, but I think that, that the point here is that there is this kind of, there, there is a sense of helplessness and disillusionment, okay? People might feel oblig, ob, finish. So. Okay, that's fine. I'll just, I'll just get on my conclusion then. So it's fine. Um, so I think that there are sort of um, questions here to be said about, um, you know, enabling both contexts to kind of benefit, if you like, from um, migration. Um, I just wanted to say a last point here in terms of engaging with the younger generation. Um, I think that that is really important. I think, again, there are tensions there in terms of generational um, differences. Um, I think that um, there is a need to sort of think more broadly and more critically about who counts as a diaspora and who can be you know, counted upon, um, if you like, in, in many ways. Um, and just lastly, I want to say that I'm currently starting a research project on um, the Greek, the Palestinian, the Jewish diasporas in terms of young people's um, politicization and daily lives um, here in the UK. So hopefully I'll be continuing um, this, this line of research. So thank you very much. Our next presenter is Antonis Piperoglu. Thank you. Um, I just want to extend my... Thanks to CSOX and uh, the Greek Diaspora Project and Orthon and Fotini and Manolis, who I haven't yet to meet, unfortunately. Uh, you've been very warm and it's been a very smooth process to come here to Oxford. My first time in these grand, funny halls, very different to Australia. In October last year, Katia Gagitsas, Greece's new trade commissioner to Australia, attended a luncheon organised by the Australian, Commerce, Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. At the luncheon, a question and answer session was held with senior representatives from the Australia-China Business Council, the Australia-China Council, the Asia Society, the Australian Chamber of Trade and International Affairs. The following month, the Greek Ministry of Econo Economy and Development and Enterprise Greece organised an investment roadshow that visited major Australian cities, titled Greece at the turning, uh, on the Turning Point. The roadshow held seminars, provided information on the latest uh, business developments in Greece and outlined the potential for investment opportunities. After the roadshow, the Minister Dimos Papadimitriou spoke to Victorian parliamentarians in Melbourne, announcing the opening of an enterprise Greece office in Melbourne. Papa Dimitriou then referred to the recent roadshow, informing his audience that, quote, Greece is at a critical turning point and we should not listen to the siren songs of petty interests. The appointment of Australian Brace Trade Commissioner, along with the positive economic issue that was presented at the roadshow and reinforced by the Minister, are emblematic of a renewed effort by the Greek government to attract investment into the country through diaspora engagement. However, as the Asia-focused representatives who took part in the Australian Chamber and Commerce Industry question and answer session reveals, recent diaspora engagement in Australia has begun to broaden the Greek government's strategic awareness of how to engage more effectively with the thriving economies of the Asia-Pacific region. Despite this, Official, representation, official operations of Greek diaspora engagement in Australia, as we've heard, just tended to be rooted in essentialist ethno-nationalist discourses, a key criticism of diaspora engagement literature more broadly. So as Elizabeth has informed us of her recent publications, Greece's attempt at diaspora engagement has been characterised therefore by a narrow imagining of how to keep Greek ethno-nationalism alive. In order for the Greek government to effectively harness the Greek diaspora in Australia, Elizabeth asserts then that an uphill struggle awaits. A struggle in which then the Greek state must shape an image of itself as trustworthy, curb corruption and uh, enhance bureaucratic uh, 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 involve in roles and provide kind of practical incentives for Greek Australian entrepreneurial investment. 
So recognising the multiplicities of emotions and disconnections that underlie diaspora experience, I would like today to claim that Greek diaspora engagement policies should reconceptualise the historical, socio-cultural, socio inter-regional and economic nuances of Greek Australia in an effort to offer then an alternative path to reconceptualising the processes of Greek diasporization in Australia, I echo historian Ioana Laliotto's call to think beyond generalised notions of diaspora and to reframe understandings within, a contextual and his, within contextual and historical specificity. I locate here the interplay between historical and contemporary Greek Australian cultural specificities that could be used to broaden the mechanics of uh, diaspora engagement. Given Giri's relatively large, multi generational, self identifying Greek Australian population, I believe that smart diaspora engagement should not merely focus on serving the national interest and move beyond bilateralism. I intend to propose diaspora engagement policies could work collaboratively, co collaboratively and more effectively with pre established diaspora bodies and Greek Australian individuals and businesses in an effort to transcend national divides and to embrace broader global outlooks. Such an approach does not seek to narrate a form of di diaspora engagement as oppositional to other for, uh, more commonplace forms of bilateral engagement. Quite differently, through stressing the capacity to think past the pragmatic emphasis on bi bilateralism, I attempt to advance already existing forms of diaspora engagement by framing a wide-ranging, historically informed and mutually beneficial form of exchange that moves towards a global reciprocity, yet acknowledges what Laliotto calls the situational entanglements of migrancy. So in an age when the world's attention is increasingly centering its focus on the so-called rise of Asia, the question of how Greece should imagine, manage and respond to economic investment from China, for example, has become a significant factor in how the country is redeveloping its long-term economic viability. Cognizant of this global phenomenon and its particular impact on Greek-Sino relations, I want to say here that facets of the Greek Australian diaspora in Australia could advantageously enhance Greek Asia relations. Relations that are characterised by overlaying networks of cross border connections and historical relationships. Just a little bit of background. In my, in my view, nuanced historical studies on Greek Australia is a relatively uncharted field. In particular, there is little robust inquiry into Greek Australian diasporic nationalism and the multiplicities of Greek Australian ethnicities. First monographs and edited volumes, as we keep hearing in Australia but elsewhere, feel, fall within a kind of celebratory social science tradition that, in, at least in Australian context, ar arises from a kind of Australian multicultural movement that focus on the ability of ethnic groups to maintain a distinctive culture while integrating into the mainstream. This tactical approach to the processes of in, uh, assimilation noted the contribution of Greek migrants and their children in Australia, emphasising their incorporation into the middle class through hard work and frugal living. This emphasis on labour practices and standard of living within the host nation aimed to counter the racialization of Greeks as outside yet within the settler colonial contours of the Australian nation. In a similar vein to other Greek migrant historiographies, in the settler colonial Anglosphere, the conceptualization of Greek migration through the lenses of integration or assimilation incorporated Greek migrant narratives into Australian historiography as a contributing factor to the history of Australian acculturation or accumulation, neglecting then intracultural, multinodal forms of migration come settler colonial cultural becoming the settler colonial aspects, meaning a particular permanence, permanency and identification with place. The preoccupation then on assimilation has then constrained scholars' interest in exploring the multiplicities of Greek sociality and cultural production in Australia. 
There is no developed historiography, for example, on how Greek migrants come settlers attempted to influence specific trends within Greece or how the Greek state attempted to maintain connections with Greek migrants. I turn here then, say, to 1912, for example, John Zavichanos, a representative from the Greek National Society Hellenismos and resident in South Africa toured Australian cities in an effort to raise funds for what he regarded as a great national undertaking, the so-called emancipation of ancient Greek territories from the, quote, yoke of the Turk. And I think it's interesting, old Greece speaks to George's paper yesterday. The archival residue reveals that Zavichanos was able to acquire, quote, liberal monetary assistance. I use this as an example just to say that there's no comprehensive estimations on the phenomenon of Greek-Australian remittances, no qualitative research into, the, into this history. And I think, sorry, I rather think that qualitative research into this history could aid how we can understand how Greeks gave to the so-called homeland. Furthermore, there is a need for more research to be, concluded, uh, to be conducted on how Greek state engaged with diaspora in Australia during the second half of the 20th century, the kind of big boom period of Greek migration. Nonetheless, in a more contemporary context, since the crisis, uh, there have been productive initiatives driven by the diaspora itself in engaging back with the homeland. And we heard yesterday from Vasiliki's paper of this organisation Friends of Gus Lorizo, formerly known as the Australian Friends of Gus Lorizo, launched in 2007. It focuses on providing, quote, skills and resources for the benefit of Gus Lorizo. The group has raised significant funds which have productively and sustainably contributed to the environmental, emotional, educational, rather, and cultural sectors of the island. The motto of the group, giving back to our forebears, and the commitment, for example, of uh, the reforestation of the island, gives, uh, uh, I think, shows us a kind of uh, trans historical diasporic attachment that locally situates, that is locally situated yet works in collaboration with the uh, municipal, national, transnational authorities. So in echoing Yoros uh, Anagnostu, there is the promise of the casting of a wider research net into the multiplicities of Greek ethnicities that could potentially yield hitherto untapped resources. And such research remodelling, in my view, could enhance engagement. For example, investigation into the emotional factors that drive return migration and diasporic tourism the modalities of economic investment, brain circulation, and family and kinship networks could be demarcated, located, catalogued, disseminated. I turn here to two, two to three quick examples. The Hong Kong High Court judge and human rights advocate, Kevin Zervis here, pictured here, is an apt contemporary figure within the Asia-based Greek-Australian diaspora. Zervos has Castro-Legion heritage, holds Australian nationality, lives in Hong Kong. He's highly regarded within the Hong Kong legal circles, regularly visits Gasolorizo, where, with his brother, he's redeveloped the ancestral home uh, and participates in events organised by the Eastern Orthodox Metropolitan of Hong Kong and Southeast Asia. Embodying what sociologist uh, Ong has termed the split between state-imposed identity and personal identity, Zervis's flexible subjectivity is informed by migration, education, modes of activism, religious affiliation and changing global markets. Utilisation of Zervos and other Asia-based uh, Greek-Australian elites per se, e expertise, their cultural awareness could provide a conduit, say, for towards harnessing knowledge-based capital that triangulates between Greece, Australia and Asia. In addition, durable Australian businesses, like the Kalis fishing firm here, founded in 1966, also has connection to Gus Lorizo, became a large firm 
uh, opened uh, wholesale and retail businesses in Vietnam, Thailand and Indonesia. Uh, recently, in 2016, uh, sold a large chunk of its business to this large Chinese firm, Legend Holdings. At a more boutique level, Baspali Pearls, a pearling pastoralist and real estate company, also having historical ties to Castellorizo, proudly uh, promoting that in its, in its business statement in 1932. Uh, Peter Paspalis opened the business, engaged with Macassan, Malay, indigenous uh, pearlers in northern Australia. Today it sells some of the most rare pearls um, at various offices across Southeast Asia and Australia. This recent quite gendered image here of promoting Australian uh, uh, fit Women's Business Council with the Chinese Australian Women's Business Council. I do not have time to go into the depth of a comparative analysis on, on, on Asia uh, diaspora policies, but we did get a hint from Anthea's work, Anthea's work before, so I'm happy to talk about that in question time. Greek Australian um, uh, elements, I would say, I, 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 Greece can groom these kind of capabilities through sincere engagement with a multi-generational assortment of Greek Australian, um, say, students. They can survey the amount of early career professionals who have studied, worked and lived in Asian countries. Can also respond, uh, give attention to the ways that trade delegations might be able to improve their relevance and return on investment. It's not clear, for example, how much business was actually conducted during the trade roadshow that I opened with. Diaspora engagement endeavours must also reconsider the historical specificities of Greek migration come settlement, acknowledge how the variability of Greek Australian histories influences the complex terrains that self-identifying Greek Australians negotiate. This suggests a step forward from previous notions of homeland diaspora relations, pointing to a more apt policy approach that is more informed with the ways that people of Greek background live in Australia and imagine Greece, while also reconsidering how the diaspora visits, works and liaises with the Asia-Pacific region. Diaspora engagement should negotiate the complexities of the Asia-Pacific region and seek better understandings of how Greek diaspora in Australia imagines its regionality and historicity. In doing so, fertile conditions for fluid engagement between people, policy and place can better position Greece's economic validity, viability and cultural rejuvenation. The individual and business practices that have been introduced, say here, reveal successful diasporic uh, business practice individuals who seek opportunities that move beyond bilateralism, linking them with regionally specific investors, collaborators, consumers, using different linguistic skills, social networks, applying different cultural knowledges. Enormous creativity, mobility and flexibility can be observed and a more adequate research model could better accommodate the multitude of possibilities that diaspora engagement could provide. So in short, Greece's engagement with Greek Australian diaspora should be inward and outward driven and be able to foster connection beyond cultural retention and migrant remittances. remittances. Multi-directional relationship building could turn brain gain into a multi-layered web of brain gain and the digital divide in a digital, into a digital dividend that nurtures and supports intradiasporic connectivity. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you uh, for having me here. And I'm going to speak about a place where I like to joke that nobody sane emigrates to since the last 200 years. Um, the, I think the Polish, the Polish um, example uh, and Greek diaspora in Poland provides a very interesting case of uh, certain 
mechanisms in reverse or um, basically what I want to see here is to put a Greek diasporic experience uh, into a perspective of a different socioeconomic uh, environment. Um, also what I'm going to show, maybe first I'll just uh, proceed to explaining who are Greeks in Poland. Uh, as we can see, it's the numbers based on Polish national census for, from 2011. Uh, there are 3,600 uh, 3, people of Greek nationality. Uh, and uh, as you can see, um, many of them, quite many of them, show, uh, declare Greek being, Greece being uh, their first national affiliation. Uh, double and nationality is also uh, prevalent here. Um, I think um, that the interesting case is, uh, here is the number of uh, Greek uh, Greeks who use Greek at home uh, out of those uh, 3,600 people and those who declare Polish nationality only out of those who um, speak Greek uh, at home. Uh, how did Greeks happen to be in Poland? Uh, well, apart from some uh, who traveled uh, uh, as early as in 16th, 17th century, um, most of them uh, are, and of course we have uh, mixed marriages or individual businesses case, cases, but this is a minority. Uh, this is the main um, reason why uh, Greeks happen to live in Poland, the context of Greek domestic war, uh, where, um, wh why am I um, stressing, out the, 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 uh, stressing the children uh, here? Because um, uh, after the, depending on the narrative, uh, evacuation or, or uh, refuge or saving the children uh, from um, the uh, domestic war. Um, after the children were accepted in all the um, Eastern Bloc, uh, various countries had various policies and uh, Poland uh, firstly accepted to uh, receive mainly children, mainly those in uh, school age. Uh, there are different statistics. It has to be, uh, here you can see that in the first wave those were mostly children who were accepted and after the war uh, also adults in the policy of uh, joining families were, um, well, came to Greece to live together. Uh, this is a very ethno, uh, not very, but ethno-linguistically heterogeneous um, group. Uh, because many or most of those people who came to Poland were from the territory of Macedonia and uh, uh, some were Slavs, some were uh, Greeks. Um, now it's difficult to assess the percentage because the sources have been used by both sides. Uh, the Slavic, uh, the Macedonian Slavic uh, organizations of Poland uh, show 50%. Uh, it's very difficult to assess that, especially as um, the, that migration happened uh, after uh, the 30s when the Slavs in uh, Macedonia, talking about, of course, Greek Macedonia, our Macedonia, were Hellenized. So um, under the Metaxas regime, the, the uh, large amount of population had their name changed into Greek sounding and usage of Slavic language was uh, forbidden. So now coming back to the different, I mean the difficulty in assessing uh, what was the language. Here I have a quoted um, book which uh, I'm going to talk about more later. Uh, we call them Mikey. Um, it's about uh, women who were taking care of those children. Uh, Mikey is a Slavic Macedonian word, it's not Serbian, it would be Maike. Uh, but it's difficult to, again, to assess whether those women wanted themselves, to, wanted to be called like this, or uh, whether it was the children's um, choice. Um, now, like, fast, very fast forward to uh, 
presence. Because what's interesting for me here is that uh, the Greek diaspora in Poland, as, as we saw, I mean, uh, there was like over 13, thousand people accepted in the 40s and 50s and in 2011 there's 3,600 people yes uh, not all of those 1300 came back to Greece or Yugoslavia many just intermarried um, so we talk about uh, Greek identity that kind of watered down I would say um, the environment in which, socio-economical environment in which uh, the Greeks in Poland were raised uh, uh, was uh, drastically different from that of Greece and Western Europe, of course, the, with the realist socialism uh, and the very rapid transition of the 90s uh, with a very turbulent change into neoliberal capitalist uh, economy. Here, what I wanted to show is that it, it's not a contest of who's more pitiful and who's more poor, like uh, if Greeks are or Poles are. It's just uh, showing certain um, statistics uh, which uh, present uh, in which context the narrative of Greek crisis um, appears in Poland. What happens here is when we see, uh, I mean, the, here the data from Poland is not available from, from before the transition. Um, at least it's not very reliable. Uh, let's say in the 50s we kind of start from similar and comparative level. As we can see, despite the crisis, um, Poles are barely <laughs> catching up to uh, Greek levels from let's say, the 80s right now when the, in, with the economic boost in Poland, which is, of course, stimulated by European uh, accession. Um, the Greek, and for example, unemployment rate, we, as Greeks know, um, how it uh, was shaped. The, what I wanted to show is the Polish drop uh, after 2004, when Poland accessed European Union. Um, yesterday, uh, it was said that uh, 500,000 Greeks uh, left Greece over 10 years. Um, I made a short, ca quick calculation, and now depending on uh, the uh, population data of Greece uh, that we take, it would uh, constitute somewhere between 46 uh, percent or and 4.75 percent of total population uh, of Greece uh, within 10 uh, years from 2004 uh, 2.4 million Poles over 38 and nearly half million uh, left which is 6.5 percent Polish population which uh, left only temporarily yes it's it's only a temporal um, migration, not counting those who left permanently. Um, here we have the data on consumer price index, which is somehow uh, comparable, let's say. Uh, now, uh, inflation rates, yes, well, polls have seen similar um, fluctuations. Minimum, gross minimum monthly wage. Uh, of course, we know the reasons why in Greece it's very flat from some uh, point. And in Poland, it raises rapidly. Uh, now, uh, the minimum wage was set uh, at the astonishing level of 500 euro, and uh, everybody's wondering whether Polish economy can afford that. Um, average monthly salary in Greece and in Poland. Uh, here Polish data is uh, um, expressed in Polish uh, złoty, but 4,000 is around 1,000 1, euro. Um, and again, I think that's the last thing, the, the productivity. You can see also that uh, Poles are getting stronger and stronger into the neoliberal um, work harder and uh, work more uh, paradigm. Uh, over the years. Um, so this is a very difficult environment uh, to um, create empathy for Greeks. 
because uh, what for, of course, acknowledging the, the, the long history of, of difficulties and poverty in Greece, uh, which I'm not contesting, uh, I'm just stating here that what is a crisis reality for Greeks after 2009 is basically a state of reality for Poles. Um, so how to uh, create compassion, how to create uh, empathy. Uh, what's also characteristic for 2011, for example, is that Polish narrative, public narrative in the media is reproducing Western and German uh, media, uh, like one-to-one. -one. Mm. So the, all the narrative of a lazy Greek, etc., is uh, very strongly um, used. And my question was whether the diaspora and which diaspora uh, engaged as agent of uh, narrative uh, shaping. Uh, well, here I'm in a difficult position <laughs> because here I answer kind of who are we as a diaspora because I was one of people who were actually translating Greek discourse into Polish, uh, but I'm not including myself because that would be just bizarre. Uh, however, we have several uh, uh, societies that uh, exist, but they, in short, they had no wide impact. Uh, the Europe is possible to be liked is uh, like pro-European propaganda TV show uh, where there was one Greek, uh, Theo Vafidis, who, who's a Greek chef, chef at the restaurant, and he's among the most recognizable Greeks. Um, I would say that the only thing he did, he tried to promote tourism to Greece and food uh, of Greece, but I would call it like crisis profiteering, that he probably made more money himself than um, for Greece. Um, here, and, and, and to finalize Dionysius stories, it's a fascinating case of a journalist who's half Greek from the family of, of the communists. He's kind of my age, two years older. We have maybe 10, 11 friends in common and close friends in common on Facebook. He wrote a very well-known uh, in Poland book, uh, Bitter Oranges, which just has been um, translated into Greek and I wholeheartedly recommend it. Um, and I chose him as the main agent of discourse production. What happens, uh, and I know um, there's like two, three minutes left, what happens when I approached him uh, to give me interview? I think it's symptomatic, because Dionysius wrote to me, um, I don't think I'm the right person. I'm like, Dionysius, well, I mean, what do you mean? You, I'm, I'm doing research in producing discourse on Greece and the crisis, and you wrote a book, actually the only book, about Greece and crisis in Poland, which had awards and was widely known. You're actually, I'm sorry, but you're the object of my research. How are you not the right person? And he sent me to other people, all, all out of whom all of them said, that, I mean, th those agreed to talk, but they were like, ah, I think I'm not very competent either. Which showed me that um, there's a high level of uncertainty about like own expertise among, among Greek diaspora in Poland. Um, what Dionysius did was he managed to beautifully introduce the discourse on Greek crisis, set it in European context, set it in the context of refugee crisis, link the Greek refugees to Poland and uh, Syrian Middle Eastern refugees to Greece, because he was writing about Balkan route too, um, and make a very complex vision of Greece, where he advocated for Greece, Greek cause. Um, did he reproduce the Greek narrative only <coughs> partly? Because in the many interviews he gave, whenever he was asked literally, but come on, Dionysius, is it really that hard? I, th the, I think his Polish part was speaking up in comparison, not really, but it's still hard. So um, if, if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer them later. Um, uh, yeah, and I wholeheartedly uh, recommend Dionysius' 
um, book because it's very difficult to um, even show the complexity of uh, issues he's uh, mentioning. And um, yeah, the, the, the image, I think, to finalize, the bitter oranges um, metaphor, which is which talks about the oranges that grow in Greece on the trees and all the tourists come and want to eat them and but they're bitter is uh, his experience and his family's experience of being Greek but again it gives a hope because a bitter orange can be made glico <laughs> so that's it thank you very much Thank you very much. I know that you are all tired and uh, I will try to be very, very brief about it. And I think that we are going to, to end this uh, cycle of uh, presentations uh, the same way we started, by presenting something about the, the GDP project. Um, okay, it's not a project of you. Um, uh, at the first panel, uh, Othon, Fotini, Irina, Donis, and Rene presented uh, the qualitative strand of the GDP project. I'm here to present you the quantitative uh, strand uh, we are uh, um, following and we are going to run in a, in a few weeks uh, from now. Um, a large-scale online survey about the, the Greeks that uh, have migrated in the, in the UK. Uh, Manolis is the leader of this, uh, this survey. He, unfortunately, he could not be, be here. Uh, but I will try to answer uh, to as many questions that may may come up. Um, uh, yesterday, Athanasius uh, also discussed about the different waves of uh, migration in the UK. So I won't stand to this uh, too much. I'm just showing, showing this slide to show you that um, uh, we're ex expecting to find different, many different diasporas. Uh, in, uh, in this uh, survey, and we are all of also very interested in this last wave, the, the wave, uh, the, the half wave, or the wave that is uh, currently under development, development um, in the UK and in Europe general. Uh, the Greek uh, people that are leaving their country now because of the, uh, the economic crisis in order to find uh, a, a better job. Um, what do the diaspora scholars um, um, uh, study uh, about uh, diaspora? Um, there are three actors that we are interested in uh, when it comes to diaspora. The diaspora group itself, uh, the homeland, and the, the host country. Uh, this survey is going to tackle with um, the, the diaspora group itself, but uh, we are also very interested in uh, its relations with the homeland and the, the, host, um, the host country. These are the basic characteristics one should um, explore regarding the diaspora group. The chronology of the, of the, the group, uh, this means that um, we want to see when they migrated, uh, if they are uh, first generation migrants or second or third generation, their causes of dispersion, um, whether they migrated because of economic reasons or any other reasons. Uh, the criteria for the definition of subgroups uh, and especially socio-demographic characteristics, the retention of ethnic culture, their spe special dimension, uh, where do they live now and why did they decide to, to go to this place, the quality of relations among the members of the community, um, um, and the um, attitudes and feelings towards homeland in par particular, the level of support, uh, to homeland, the level of effect, the level of activity, uh, the content of this activity, and the extent of their contact with uh, their family and friends in, uh, in homeland. Let's see some things about um, our research questions that um, uh, come from the, uh, 
from, from what I presented you in the, in the previous slide. We have two core research questions uh, that are uh, descriptive and explorative. Uh, the first one is about the socioeconomic, political and cultural profile of the Greek diaspora in the UK. Uh, we want to know what is their socioeconomic position and embeddedness in the um, uh, UK society, their motivation, the motives um, uh, to migration and their future plans, whether they are planning to return to, to Greece or not. The value system, political and socio-cultural, this is um, a, a special section about uh, uh, political behavior of the uh, Greek diaspora in the UK. And the second uh, research question is to what extent and other what, what conditions are Greeks in the UK willing and able to contribute uh, to Greece at times of uh, crisis? This means diaspora engagement, diaspora attachment, and diaspora uh, contrib contribution. Because we want also to give uh, some info to policy experts in Greece um, uh, to see what um, uh, needs to be done in, in order to engage um, uh, in many, many more ways with the, the Greek uh, diaspora. Uh, the questionnaire design. Uh, has been formatted in uh, six core blocks of questions. Uh, the first block is um, about their decision for migration in, and its evaluation, their economic integration in the UK, their social life in the UK and the Greek identity and the Greek community in the UK, contacts and bond with Greece, political attitudes and belief beliefs about, about the recent economic crisis in Greece and plans for the future. We have almost 90 questions and um, uh, uh, there is also, <laughs> there is always a um, place for, for more more questions, but uh, when someone needs uh, 25 minutes to, to fill in a questionnaire, it gets uh, a little bit uh, too large, so we are trying to, to keep it um, small, <laughs> uh, although it is not so small with 90 questions. Let's see some things about the, the sample population. Uh, Professor Koniordos and Daimeric also presented some data on the Greek population in the, in the UK. We have different sources of data um, from the labor force survey, the census data from 2001 and 2011, and uh, we have also the national insurance number registrations. As, as you can see here, uh, the, uh, the figure of um, immigrants that uh, has migrated in the UK in the recent years has almost doubled. Uh, from 2011 to 2017. Uh, let's not discuss this uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, and let's see another graph that is confirming, confirming the, uh, what I, I told you, that uh, too many Greeks are uh, coming in the UK in order to find a job. This is the data from national insurance number registrations. Uh, we, we also have... Um, information that uh, the previous presenters show, showed to us about the educational level uh, that is very, very high uh, for the Greeks in the UK and the, the, the professional categories. I mean, they, they mostly are managers and uh, administrative staff and we have much, much less uh, laborers uh, and elementary occupations, but as you can see here, from 2012 and onwards, this type of occupation is increasing too. So um, this is challenging for us to find these uh, these people too in uh, in our uh, sample. And we also know about the age that they are in the younger ages that are uh, migrating in order to find a, a, a job. Uh, is, are these data enough in order to, to design a large-scale uh, survey? Uh, are these data for our sample enough? Uh, we believe no, because uh, the labor force survey uh, has almost uh, 50 to 80 Greek people in their sample in every survey they are conducting. Uh, the national insurance registrations uh, national insurance number registrations 
uh, give us only information about the Greeks that come here in order to work. Uh, so we don't have a complete picture about uh, who are the Greeks that are coming here and where they are in order to find them and have a completely, completely representative uh, sample. This is why you have chosen uh, to follow the respondent-driven sampling um, methodology. Uh, the RDS is utilized in numerous surveys um, among hard-to-reach populations populations that we don't have in, uh, enough data uh, for them. And uh, uses the, the social network theory uh, that uh, attempts to, maps, to map relationships and characteristics shared by groups. What is the characteristic we want to, uh, to find in, in our sample? In all the Greeks that uh, live now in the, in the UK. Uh, and uh, RDS, peer-to-peer uh, -peer recruitment, relies on populations being connected through social uh, networks. Uh, if you haven't heard the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, process of, uh, of recruit recruiting, uh, you should, um, uh, many, many of you perhaps uh, downloaded uh, uh, movies in the internet and uh, know the peer review process, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, process. This is, this is an example. Uh, we are going to give the questionnaire, uh, the link for the questionnaire to one seat, that is this one here, this person here, that is going to, to share this questionnaire to three more peers. And we expect the, that uh, these peers are going to share the, the questionnaire with other peers and create this chain um, uh, of uh, people that are going to uh, to answer the questionnaire. This is a simple one. This is a more complicated one uh, about the, the sampling methodology. And uh, I'm not an expert in this, Manolis is, but believe me, there are statistical procedures to, uh, that um, can help us to control the sample and make it as more representative as, uh, as possible. And now a small spoiler alert about the, the results of the survey. I'm going to give you some data from an only survey uh, uh, for, um, for the Greeks in the greater London area that he conducted in 2017. I'm also uh, discussed some uh, findings. Let's see some things about the, the reason for migration. As you can see, uh, the reasons for migration is mostly economic reasons and uh, better working condition uh, reasons uh, by, by far. Um, additionally, their expectations uh, about life abroad and their work evaluation are extreme, ex extremely good. I mean, they have great expectations and, that, and they seem to, to complete these expectations because they found a, a very good uh, job that uh, uh, satisfies them. Uh, what about their future plans? Are they planning to return? No. 56% <laughs> uh, um, response that they want to, to remain in the current uh, city of residence in uh, Greece, and only 5.4% uh, wants to, to return to, to Greece. What is the reason that we would make them to return? Only if they go on pension, so they <laughs> want, don't want to return um, recently. If they, their partner finds a, a job in Greece that would satisfy them economically, and nostalgia for life in, uh, in Greece. Um, we have also discussed about uh, remittances in the previous panel. Uh, I won't uh, stand to this, uh, to this slide uh, much more. I just want to say that uh, we have included an um, um, indirect 
um, question about remittances, we decided to ask them if they are paying bills or taxes for their parents or their, their family in, uh, in Greece. So we are not asking only if they are sending money uh, to the bank, but we are asking if they are paying uh, bills uh, for the, their family. And last, um, or uh, this is not the final slide, this is uh, the, the kind of uh, engagement uh, they want to, uh, to acquire, uh, whether it is business collaboration or uh, whether it is uh, contribution uh, in uh, raise, raising expertise of uh, knowledge or uh, uh, philanthropic um, um, contribution. And now last but not least, uh, whether they want to vote and uh, in Greece, uh, I told you that we have a, a special uh, section about political behavior in Greece. Uh, here you can see that 80% uh, of them really want to have the right uh, uh, to vote uh, from, from abroad. Uh, uh, Labrini uh, gave me some uh, data about the participation of Greeks uh, uh, in the last uh, primary, primary elections for the center left, and uh, there were there were almost uh, 400 Greeks in the UK that voted for the primaries, and uh, this is uh, almost the same number in the in uh, Germany, I think. Um, so I think it is a very big uh, number, considering that uh, we were never used in voting for primaries in political uh, parties. So uh, these and many, many more, th more things are going to present to you uh, in our next conference in, uh, in Athens, uh, perhaps ne next year. So you're all invited there. Thank you.